Uh, we're going to begin our studies now in Matthew chapter 5. It seems like to me that I, uh, last Sunday, dealt with the fifth verse, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And I focused on the, the word earth there to um, <clears throat> uh, emphasize the fact that the gospel message was not to the Jew only. It was to the Jew and the Gentile. And when you, you read this statement, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, when you think about the term inheritance, uh, you can't help but think about the Jew and the promised inheritance for the Jew, which was the land of Cana from the river Euphrates all the way down to the river Nile. But in this particular statement, we have a much larger inheritance. We're talking about a territory that is much larger than from the Tigris Euphrates River to the River Nile. You're talking about inheriting the entire earth. And so what we have in scope here is the uh, eternal plan of God, which was not just God's chosen people, the Jew, and the inheritance as, as, it, as it related to the Jew, the eternal plan of God has been for the whole world from the beginning. The only reason the Jews were lifted out uh, as a peculiar people and as God's chosen was for purposes of symbolism to, through them, illustrate his eternal plan. God's plan has been as equal for the Gentile as it has ever been for the Jew. And it's very important for us to understand that. What about John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel message has been to the Jew and the Gentile. I mean, folks, think about it. Uh, there's all kinds of prejudice in the world. Uh, there's uh, uh, racial prejudice has been with us for uh, literally thousands of years. But we're all of one blood. We all came from the family of Adam. And the Jews that are in the world had the same father as uh, the Gentiles, the Gentiles and Jews. We all had the same father. Adam and when you get saved you end up with the same father there is but one father and so it's important for us to see the big picture I, I've, uh, I've been big on this for quite some time because it has helped me so much to put the Bible in perspective and, and understand the message better um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to go into this any further. I just wanted to re-emphasize that particular point as it related to the fifth verse, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is the disposition of, of every person that is genuinely saved. It is, um, it is um, a characteristic, a, a form of humility, that, that will characterize, without any question, uh, the person who understands verse 3, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, those who see their spiritual bankruptcy, and then in verse 4 are broken over it. The mourning aspect here is brokenness over what we discover ourselves to be because God has revealed to us the truth about ourselves. You know, that secret side of our existence that we keep so guarded and uh, 
uh, from the world that we do not want the world to know about. But it's there. We know what we are. And God knows what we are, and he has revealed to us what we are. And when he does, then it results in our brokenness over that discovery. Um, and then the result is a, is a complete change in one's character from being prideful uh, to, being, to being meek, so to one who, who has been delivered from the entitlement mentality of I deserve this and I deserve that and so forth to the mentality of deserving of nothing but hell. Folks, that's the, the true inner thought life of a genuine believer. And if you do not have these kinds of thoughts, bless your heart, you're not saved. Absolutely. A person that is genuinely saved is going to find himself, herself, alone before God in an agony over the discovery of these truths. And it's a genuine thing. It's not something that you, you, you work up for a few moments, you know, and, and then try to console yourself and saying, well, that's, that's my belief, that's what I believe. No, this is, a, this is a living reality in the heart of the genuine believer. It's a genuine thing. And I'll tell you what, it, it will revolutionize your relationships with other people as well as that with God. Uh, as the, you know, the vertical and the horizontal, as Brother Jim was talking about the other other day in this message, uh, when you get this right with God, it's going to affect your relationship with others. And you will find yourself, <clears throat> I believe this with all my heart, I believe when, when God works this into your heart and, and you're genuinely saved, as you then go out in your daily life, uh, involving yourself uh, in the lives of other people and them involving their life, their life in, in yours, your perspective toward them is going to radically change. And, and it's going to radically change in a way that's consistent with what this is teaching here about the genuine believer. And from that point on that you receive the Lord in truth as your Savior. You will no longer look at other people with judgmental eyes and a judgmental heart in a condescending way. You will see people in their faults as being a mirror of you. That's what you'll see. Because, you see, a genuine believer understands Romans chapter 2, the first few verses there. Who art thou that judgest another? For wherein thou judgest another, thou doest the same things. A genuine believer is going to think that way. And these thoughts are going to come to his mind. The Holy Spirit is going to bring these thoughts to the genuine believer's mind as they're dealing with other people in the world and it's going to radically change your view of them because of how you view yourself. It is impossible to condescend somebody when you have received the message from heaven about you. What about you? Forget about everybody else. What about you? That's what this message, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, will do to you when you receive it. It will change your perspective of other people so that the first thing that, that comes to your mind is, well, I wonder about what this person is not saved and I think that the way I need to use my mind is to is to analyze their their true condition before the Lord and then 
by the Spirit of God working in me, try to minister to that condition in a loving way. Not in a judgmental way that writes people off and says, well, did you hear about what so-and-so did the other day or whatever? No, a genuine believer is going to have a caring spirit, a loving spirit. The same, you're going to have the heart of God who left heaven's glory and came down here. Why? Not to point out people's faults and, um, you know, go around and talk behind their back about them. When Jesus Christ found me, he loved me. He loved me. And you can, you can think that you're a, a Christian because of some self-contrived definition that you've given to it. But this is the defini definition of being genuinely saved. It's this one. It's from the Savior himself. And he says that your primary concern needs to be you, not the people around you, but you and me. You know, you hear uh, about people, especially certain famous personalities that, that pass away. We just heard about Tony Snow, the news uh, uh, Anchorman, and I think more recently the uh, White House spokesperson for the president. And I didn't know uh, Tony Snow. I, I knew very little about him. You're talking about Tony Snow? Tony Snow. Yeah, Tony Snow died uh, just the other day. Um, and I do know I've, I do know that he was a very conservative individual. Um, his uh, religious background, Roman Catholic. I learned that. And when you hear that someone has gotten sick and they've they've passed away like that your heart goes out to the family your your thoughts immediately uh, at least for me it it goes to wondering well I, I I pray that person was saved I pray that they at some point came to know the Lord and uh, I have no idea where Tony Snow is right now But I know this, uh, the most important thing in the world is you getting it right as to your personal relationship with Jesus Christ and that you understand this message right here, Sermon on the Mount, and you get this message right. Because, you see, life is not about convincing other people around you, even the closest people to you, uh, who you are and what you are. That's not what life is all about. It's about you learning the truth about who you are. And the fact that the Lord is not pleased with who you are, what you are. As a matter of fact, he wants you completely recreated, changed, converted. He wants to make you a new creature because you're not accepted. You've got a problem. It's a radical problem. We need a total, a complete overhaul, mind, soul, and spirit. That's the truth about every person. As a matter of fact, we are totally bankrupt when it comes to righteousness of any kind. We're not right in any area. 
totally corrupt, deserving of hell. That's the message of the book. And what we need is the gift of God's righteousness. We need that gift by his grace and by his mercy. It's two of the most important words in the human vocabulary. Grace and mercy. That's what we need. And um, when we begin to see ourselves as we really are through the very eyes of God, it will radically, it will radically affect your perception of other people, how you treat them, how you think about them, how you talk about them. And that's what this passage is, is really teaching us. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You will grow to hate your life, to hate your very personal self, not just what you do from time to time. But the, the greater cause of, of why you do those things, why those thoughts come to your mind that are not acceptable to God, it's because of what we are in our nature. It's a huge problem. And I don't care how you try to change, you can't. You cannot change yourself. You cannot. You cannot educate yourself. You cannot fill your mind with the Word of God in such a way that all of a sudden you start thinking different. No, we need a change that begins at the very core of our being and our very souls. And only God can do that, the Creator. He has to recreate us. He has to give us a new life. Uh, and so that all of this leads us to this next verse, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. These verses that have preceded this are necessary to uh, be the beneficiaries of uh, what we see here in verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. There are just a number of things suggested by this. The first thing is the discovery that we have none, no righteousness, which is what Paul was talking about in the book of the Romans. There's none righteous, no, not one. I mean, think about it. Who is going to hunger and thirst after righteousness if they've already got it? That's kind of like uh, somebody getting up pretty hungry one day and they go downtown here and they eat at one of the restaurants and just fill themselves to the brim. And then all of a sudden the phone rings and it's a friend saying, hey, you want us to go out to eat? And you say, well, <laughs> I'd kind of like to, but I'm, I'm full. I'm, I can't do that. I'm, I'm full. When it comes to the message of this book, this is the mentality of the whole world. Because the whole world is already full of self and quite satisfied with self. Mm. Years ago in Kenton, when I first came here, I met a gentleman who took me hunting. I said, I'm, a, I'm a man that's never been to El Salvador before. And we went out of quail that day. This was on Thanksgiving Day. And he said, Now we got to stop over here at my relatives and we're going to have a Thanksgiving dinner. I said, I can't do that. He said, well, Yes, you can. Well, you'll hurt their feelings. So we went over there. It was a beautiful dinner. And the bull laid out. He said, Okay, sit down. Said, well, how about the women? Oh, no, no, they'll leave that for the men. This is old time, you know. So there was only one big handful there, so that my wife had cooked that big dinner at home. Mm. And I wanted to prove you to a point mm. that I ate another full dinner so I didn't escape trouble. So there is an exception to every rule, isn't there? Well, there is. <laughs> you are the exception to the rule, PC. 
You're a very unique man. Unique, if that's a word. Right? Yeah. Um, so, a person is not going to hunger and thirst after righteousness if they've already got it, if they think they're, they're already righteous. But this verse is, uh, is a verse that is said for the sake of those who have discovered the truth of the things that have been said previously. We're poverty stricken. We're bankrupt when it comes to uh, the virtues of God. So blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. <laughs> so the significance of this statement is central to the doctrine of total depravity. That's basically what we're talking about here. There is no inherent righteousness without God's gift. We have no righteousness apart from the gift of God. The other thing that I'd, I'd like to point out to you as we speak of, of righteousness, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, there's more here than just behavior. You know, it, there's more here than just doing right. Uh, there's more here than just the righteous works of God. It goes deeper than that. You see, righteousness is as a as a as a result. It's a manifestation of what you are in terms of your person. And you see, if we do not go there in our thoughts, then we're not going deep enough. We're not talking about just the outward uh, appearance of a man, uh, even in terms of the works of God. We're not talking about just what you see outwardly. We're talking about something much deeper. We're talking about the very person of God himself. I mean, if it's the case that man has no righteousness, we're not even talking about man anymore in this verse. It cannot be found on this earth among men. That is righteousness. This verse takes us to the throne of heaven. It takes us to the very person of God himself. Now, keep in mind that all throughout the scriptures, and this is a pervasive teaching all throughout scripture, and especially in the New Testament, there's none righteous. No, not one. There's, there are none that are good. And so, <clears throat> hungering and thirsting after righteousness forces you to look above, to look heavenward, because that's where is to be found. In Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 16, there's a verse there that speaks of the Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. The concern here is not just right behaving. It goes beyond that. It, it says the Lord, our righteousness. It's, it's personal. You can't separate um, what the Lord is attempting to do in and through us to just changing our behavior. It's, it goes deeper than that. It goes to the very core of our being and, and who and what we are as a person, as a human being. That's where the problem is. It isn't just what we do that's the problem. It's what we are. And when it comes to the conversion that we need, it goes deeper than just changing our behavior so that we begin to do right rather than the wrong that we did before.
in Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17, the Lord said, Their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Their righteousness is of me. Very personal. The way the Bible is written, you cannot think of salvation apart from the person of Jesus Christ. You, you cannot. Uh, there's people all around us here, be going, they'll be going to church today, and, and their whole hope for heaven is the fact that they've turned over the new leaf, they've stopped doing this, and they've started doing good things. They've started going to church, they've started reading their Bible, They've started being kinder to the people around them. And the focus of everything is works. It, it's it's, it's uh, becoming a good person, at least in terms of behavior. Folks, that's not salvation. You can change your life in many, many ways to become a better person, at least in the perception of other people as they see you and lose your soul forever. Our need is much deeper than that. You see, man wants independence from God, and if he can somehow or other have righteousness and, and change his life himself by his own works and try to emulate the virtues of God by works, then he'll do it. He'll do anything to keep from having to die to self and receive as one's life Jesus Christ. But that, that will not result in salvation. If anything, it results in a greater damnation. Because it's a it shows the intensity of man's defiance of God and of his message. Man by nature doesn't want God. He doesn't want a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He doesn't want that personal relationship with Jesus Christ that is private and that, that is personal and, and that is secret. It's the secret of the mind and the heart. This is the love of my life is the Lord. The natural man doesn't want that. Right, turn with me to Romans chapter 10. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Uh, Romans chapter 10. I, I have memorized that chapter before. It, 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 uh, I cannot quote it right now. I, I'm, I'm not good at memorizing large passages. But from time to time, I do try to commit passages to memory and I, I have before at, at a certain point been able to quote this chapter from memory because it's so important to me. It's important to me. I didn't do that for somebody else. I did it for me. Because this passage right here uh, captures the whole message of the Bible in, in the most uh, informative way but it begins, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, but I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now this is so characteristic of the entire human race, is uh, people having a zeal of God, you know, uh, living in a religious context, but shrouded in ignorance, not having a proper understanding of, of God. And as a result, lost. Because Paul's prayer here to God is for Israel that they might be saved. And, and here they are, they're the lost people, but they have a zeal of God. but not according to knowledge. 
Folks, we have such an advantage to be able to come here to this church to study, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Because there you have the knowledge of God. That's what you have. You have the knowledge of God. You have God himself explaining to you precisely what it means to be genuinely saved. And we so desperately need that. There are people in this church that desperately need that. My wife was looking the other day at, at uh, MySpace on the internet uh, because somebody had, had called her and told her about some different individuals in the church that had a, a MySpace place. I don't know anything much about that. I, I did hear about it, spoken about it at the convention, uh, Christian Educators Convention, and I do not spend time on the computer other than my business, and that's it. I don't, I don't really like computers that much. I just do what I have to do to make a living. Um, but it's, it's interesting to me how a person could come to this church and then have a side to their life where what is really in a person's mind and heart comes out. And what you discover is the lowest filth that you could ever imagine. Folks, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter what your public perception is in the ultimate sense. Uh, in terms of how others see you. I, I didn't say that quite right. It doesn't really matter the perception of other people toward you. That's not the ultimate issue in life. Uh, dropping into church ever so often and keeping up appearances as to what you are as a human being. Folks, that's such a waste. Let's, let's, let's cut to the chase. Let's, let's just get honest and, and let's not waste our time Let's just, uh, let's just be honest. The only thing that matters is <clears throat> God's perception of you, which is in truth. He knows us up one side and down the other. We just, to, we just need to make ourselves aware once again of how true that is and that one of these days like Tony Snow we're going to die we don't know when it could be tomorrow he was 53 years old we do not know how long our days are going to be upon this earth I know of some people in this town that in their 20s and 30s have just like that dropped dead had no clue there was a thing in the world wrong with them. I've known people who to, to go and visit, people who are sick in the hospital, who are dying in the hospital, but the people who went to visit died before they did. Go figure. Folks, um, sometimes we think to ourselves, well, we've got many years we're, we're young or maybe older but healthy. I was doing, uh, I can do 35, 45 push-ups uh, and was doing that the day before I had a heart attack two months ago. I could do uh, 50 squats, squat jumps, deep knee bends all the way down, can still can right now. I was in excellent condition uh, as, as far as I thought. Good health. Ate right. Did most everything right. And I collapsed in my office. Completely collapsed. Passed completely out. They tell me that I had a heart attack. Um, now let me tell you something. If that's our 
true condition as we live in the world. Don't ever try to comfort yourself with how you may appear to be. Let me tell you what the truth is. Every person in here has been told by the doctor, you're dying. You're not going to survive. You're dying. Everybody in here has been told that. Told that by the great physician. You're going to die. You're going to do that. And you do not know when. You do not know when. Now let's just be real. Forget about trying to fool your own mind and heart about your relationship with the Lord. Forget about all that. It's a waste of time. Absolutely a, a waste of time. I would hope that coming to Sunday school today would change your life forever because of what you're hearing. I would pray to God that it would. If you're not already thinking this way and completely sold out to these kinds of thoughts. But I would encourage you to have a personal, private relationship with the person, Jesus Christ, that means something. That means something. I'm not talking about just finally disciplining yourself to get that five or ten minutes in the morning to have a quick devotional where you read a few verses, that kind of thing. I'm not talking about that. That's an insult to the one who died for you. That's an insult. I'm talking about a relationship that begins with the Lord and uh, reading verses in the Bible certainly is a is a is a part of that because this is his very mind. This this is as close as you can get to God, is his word. You can't get any closer to a person than that. If you think of it this way, this is not just words on a page, it's not just a book. It's God. It's the revelation of his innermost self. It's his thought life. It's his soul. It's his love letter to you. He loves you. This is the way he talks to you. And if you read the Bible that way and view it as a conversation with God as he speaks to you, it's different. It's different. It's no longer just reading verses. It's different. It's personal. It's very personal. Folks, if you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're missing everything. You may be missing salvation. And then um, the person of Christ goes with you. You don't just meet with him and leave him. You meet with him and you go with him the rest of the day and into the night. And you never live outside of his presence. And everywhere you go, he's with you. And you're communing with him. And you're talking with him. You're fellowshipping with him. That's what it means to be a Christian. I'm telling you that this world is full of people who claim to be saved that don't know what they're talking about. And I believe people in fundamental churches all over this country are going to hell because they don't know they don't know this message. It's a wonderful thing to have all of this resolved and perfectly understood in your heart apart from anybody else's perception of you. So that if there is an event and all of a sudden you collapse or whatever or the doctor looks at you and says, you've got a problem,
from the very depths of your heart, you can commune with yourself. You can talk with yourself. And you can say, well, it's all right. I know one thing. I know that if I don't survive, I'm going to be with the Lord. And you know that's true. You know it's true for yourself. Because God has told you himself. Do you have a relationship like that with the Lord? You need to have. You're missing something. You need a personal, private relationship with Jesus Christ in truth. And that's what this passage is about here in Romans 10. For I bear them record, verse 2, that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. It's profound ignorance to think that somehow or other we can have some righteousness within ourselves that's going to make us acceptable to God should we die. That's not true. We're totally depraved. We're, we're spiritually bankrupt. We're poverty stricken when it comes to righteousness. And if we're going to have a zeal that's according to knowledge, then we're going to have to understand that the only righteousness there is in the universe is the righteousness of God. For they, uh, uh, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. What we need is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. We need God himself. This is not just, again, it's, it's not just a, a life of works where we manifest the virtues of God. It goes deeper than that. You have to have his very life to have the righteousness of God because they're inseparably related. The righteousness of God cannot exist apart from God himself. And that's the deeper part. So the inevitable result of conviction over one's poverty of spirit, as we saw it in verse 3, the inevitable result is a, is a hunger and thirst for the gift of of God's righteousness. That's what's going to happen to you. When you get saved, if, if you're genuinely saved, there is going to be a genuine hungering and thirsting after the righteousness of God. Your whole perspective is going to shift away from the earth and from self and from people. And all of a sudden, you're going to be God-centered and you're going to see him as your everything. As your everything. Your only hope, your reason for living. Your joy, your happiness, your purpose, the meaning of life. He, he is your everything. And so you begin to hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. Hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God is one of the clearest descriptions of salvation by grace to be found in the Bible. Do you hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God? I mean, what does it mean to hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God? What does that mean? We need to know what it means. It needs to be something that is operating in our personal lives. 
And the reason this is so important to understand is because, you see, the Lord is describing to us here the inner thought life of the genuine believer. This has got to be true of you if you're genuinely saved. It has to be true of me if I'm genuinely saved. This hungering and thirsting for righteousness is not a hunger and thirst for righteousness as a mere quality of character for oneself. It's more than that, as we've mentioned already. This is a hunger and thirst for the personal life of Jesus Christ. To know him and to be one with him. Psalm 42 says, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. And then David says, When shall I come and appear before God? Very important question. When shall I come and appear before God? Well, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is imminent. He could come at any moment. Your going to Him is imminent. It could happen at any moment. Folks, let me tell you something. You can fall over dead just like that at any moment. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a, a little time, then it vanishes away. And what do we know about tomorrow? Nothing. We know nothing about tomorrow. We know not what a day may bring forth, is what the scriptures say, and it's the truth, quite obviously. So the point that we're making here is that righteousness is a person. Turn with me to John chapter 6, and we'll have to close with this uh, passage, but I'd like to take you to it. John chapter 6. We're talking about hungering and thirsting after righteousness. I'm trying to show you the personal side of that, how that we're not talking about a mere quality of, of life in the way of behavior. We're talking about something much deeper than that. We're talking about the very life of God, the very person of God, in verse 48 of John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. I am, I am the bread of life. It's very personal. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Now what he's talking about here is the manna in the wilderness is much like people wanting to um, you know, um, um, treat righteousness as just a change of behavior from doing bad to doing good. Well, you can change in this world from doing bad to doing good and die in the wilderness. And that's the message. You'll still die in the wilderness. But there's a kind of hungering for bread that will result and life everlasting. And there's a difference. There's a huge difference. He says in verse 49 to repeat, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. There's a righteousness that results in life forevermore. I am the living bread. Notice the I am as he speaks about the bread. The bread, the righteousness that we're talking about is a person. It's the eternal I am of the Old Testament whose name is Jesus Christ. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? 
Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, very personal, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood and hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in you. What is the Lord saying here? Why would he use such language? Here's the reason, folks. It's one thing to think about righteousness independent from Christ. And it's altogether a different thing to think of righteousness as Christ. The world of difference. Righteousness is Him. This destroys, this language destroys the possibility of works salvation. That's what it does. It destroys the possibility of that. It drives you to the person of Christ. That's what you need. You need Christ. His plan from the beginning of the world was that we might be with him as he is with the Father. That we might be together. That we might be one. That's what it means to be saved. That's what it means to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We'll look at this more next week, Lord willing. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your precious word. Bless our time as we gather in here to study the scriptures together that we might uh, uh, come to Christ. Uh, this is the whole purpose of the giving of your word is that all men might be drawn to you. And I pray that this might be done. Bless in the message that follows. And we ask this, these things in, in Jesus' name. Amen.